Hello everybody and welcome to the NBA Show Reviews. This time we're going to be reviewing episode 17 of season 4, Some Pony to Watch Over Me, written by Scott Sonborn, newcomer to the show. This is James Cork and with me I have Norman Sanso. Hey Norman. Hello James, hello audience. And we also have Sketchy Sounds. Hey Sketchy. Hello everyone, you just can't keep me away it seems. <laughs> We had to keep bringing you in, especially when we have to review episodes so sketchy as this one. Um, <laughs> how is everybody doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing pretty well. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's great. Oh, man. What a week. What a week. I am like one day away from my birthday because if you remember from previous episode, we are reviewing this one right after the previous one because we didn't have an episode review last week. Shh, don't spoil the sense of mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I completely dated this episode review. <laughs> Indeed. But your birthday is tomorrow, right, James? Like what you said in the previous episode? Yeah, it is tomorrow. It is tomorrow. Oh, I'm boy. hyped for it. Um, you know, the thing that I do with, with uh, this kind of special occasions is that I take it as not just one day, but an entire month. Oh, really now? Yeah, yeah, because I am like, why are you making just one day special? Let's make the entire month special. So the, the, during the entire month of March, I just uh, uh, dedicate a bit of me time. And then I spend doing things for everybody else for the rest of the year. Mm, that's good. Mm-hmm. It's a way to approach it. That's a good philosophy. A good philosophy. <laughs> yeah, the same thought as me, Norman. Yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> but we're not talking about my birthday. We are talking about... Ponies, I'm going to review this episode. Indeed. So, episode 17, some pony to watch over me. I'm going to just right, jump right into it. Mm-hmm. What did you guys think of this episode? I like it. It's one of those episodes where you don't want to hang over someone, loom over them, um, take uh, care of uh, their every qualms, and don't let them do any mistakes. It's one of those episodes, and I do like this episode. I quite enjoyed it as well. I mean, the premise of it was certainly quite good. It was interesting to see the idea of the very real concern that a lot of um, siblings, parents and guardians face of leaving their child alone to look after the house for the first time. It's always a big test of responsibility to see, you know, whether they are actually capable of this. And Applejack's concerns although somewhat exaggerated for the purposes of comedy, were nevertheless in many cases valid. Although I have to say I was a little bit alarmed when she was like, oh wait, I didn't say on the list that if she wants to look out the window, she has to open it first or something like that. No, it was, if, she wants to, if she wants to get some cutlery out of the drawer, she has to open it first. It's like, I think she's a bit beyond that stage, Apple Jack. <laughs> <laughs> that is taking care of someone and then there is get them out <laughs> uh, uh, I really like this episode as well mm. I I thought it was the kind of episode that has a very slow build up to an unbelievable payoff and that's that's pretty much how it works at least for me it takes a bit to like get going, but once it gets going, like when when they get to the fire swamp, everything is just unbelievably awesome. Mm-hmm. That is true. Yeah. That is true. Until then, it's all a very nice, very well, very well uh, uh, done slice of life episode, like straightforward slice of life. And uh, regarding Applejack's con- concerns about that, I already talked about this on my on my written review of the episode, but I'm going to bring it up here because people are saying, oh, Applejack is going over the top, being overprotective and anything. Well, not only is Applejack in, has Applejack been in charge of Apple Bloom since forever, and she has been overprotective with her since Bridal Gossip, mm-hmm. which, by the way, guys, that we had the, some, the exact same scenario in Bridal Gossip with Applejack being protective of Apple Bloom and not wanting her to get hurt by Sakura's evil ways. Uh, but it's like Apple Bloom is taking care not only of the farm and the house, but the livelihood of the Apple family. True, true. Yeah, like, it's like this is the first time that Apple Bloom is going to be taking care of the family business just for a couple of hours. Yeah, nothing major, but... You can understand Applejack's con- concern about, oh my god, is she going to take care of everything? Is she going to be alright? She's going to get hurt, I know that. In my opinion, that was pretty uh, relatable. Like, more than more than once, it, t- it took me forever to uh, 
be able to let my si- my little sister go and mm-hmm. grow on her own and like let them, letting her do her own thing. Like, I think until she was like 15 years old or something, I was concerned about her. So I can totally relate with Applejack. Oh, yeah. As I said before, that whole aspect of it was entirely relatable. I know what those concerns are like. I mean, for a bit of context, background here, um, I'm the youngest of four siblings. Um, and I experienced things when I was younger very much from Apple Bloom's perspective of having mostly my mother, but also at times my older siblings as well, s- just occasionally being looking out for me more than was necessary and being more concerned for my safety than they needed to be. At the same time, it's also entirely possible for a young person to completely overestimate their abilities and think that they're going to be all right when they genuinely won't. But sometimes the only way you can learn in that sort of situation is by going ahead and trying something and then failing at it and realizing that you cannot handle yourself in that situation. But that's an entire kettle of fish, and it wasn't what happened in this regard. But yeah, I liked seeing that. And it was also uh, entertaining to see how things develop. We go from seeing Apple Bloom being over the moon, finally being left alone on her, on her, you know, being left to look after things on her own for once, and then you know Applejack making her way away and starting to freak out and think, you know, oh, is Apple Bloom going to be okay? And it's like, and you can see, you know, it, you can see that it's only Applejack that's really concerned because when she t- stops, turns around, and starts going back, the look that Big Mac has on his face volumes of his opinion on this. He's just like, oh, for God's sake. Oh, I'm trapped in this universe full of mares, and I can only say two words. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is so true. That is so true. But uh, I did like how we then saw, you know, when when Applejack got back, it was just purely a case of terrible timing. Because when she returned... Apple Bloom had actually just finished doing pretty much everything that was on the list, but then when Applejack came back, she startled Apple Bloom and could set off a chain reaction of events that resulted in a huge mess happening. And she was like, "Oh, you can't handle this!" and and then, uh, yeah, then as other people have noted, then it does get a wee bit seemingly seemingly out of character in the Applejack then went a bit over the top in her. Uh, safety measures. I mean, we get to the stage of her having put two helmets on that. <laughs> oh, God. That was a really ingenious way to break in the rule of threes when it comes to comedy. Mm. Like, uh, previous to, to the scene where Applejack puts two helmets on Apple Bloom, we have had three previous scenes where she puts a helmet on her. <laughs> and they're like, okay, what are they going to do next? She puts another helmet on top of her head. And I'm like, yeah, that, you know what? That is actually pretty funny. Yeah. And as a yeah. joke, it's a good running gag because, okay, in the first scene, well, we see Applejack putting a helmet on her. Okay, she took it off. Next scene, okay, not a helmet. Okay, she didn't take it off. What now? Not a helmet. <laughs> uh, just so funny. And like I said, this is not a case of... It's not a case of Applejack being out of character. It is a case of Applejack being overprotective. Mm-hmm. But then again, you kind of like don't... You cannot fault her for it because... Uh, uh, like, I don't know if it happened to you guys, but we, uh, big brothers, we are uh, very worried and very paranoid about, about seeing our younger siblings grow up and and becoming independent. I'm not sure, maybe I am reading too much into this, but it's kind of like, it's a big concern when we realize that our, our younger brothers don't need us anymore. Oh, and yeah. it's like, they can fend for, for themselves. So... Yeah, I can totally see Applejack's concern about this, in that, oh my god, I don't want anything bad to happen to you, I'm going to cover everything with baby wrap. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, that's taking it to the extreme, but yeah. to be honest with you, for a cartoon, that's not a case of extreme overprotective oh, no, uh, yeah. behavior. If you if you want to see overprotective behavior taken to the extreme, uh, watch The Village. From the perspective of it being a cartoon, I mean, part of the way you, that you do comedy in a cartoon is to take something that is natural and relatable and then exaggerate it. And what we see is simply an exaggeration of, nevertheless, what many perfectly 
otherwise sane and logical creatures, human beings, would do in that sort of situation. I mean, granted, I don't think anyone would go quite so far as to coat their entire house and uh, furniture in bubble wrap or (laughs) put one helmet on their child. But I certainly have seen and heard of instances where parents or older siblings have gone a little bit too far in looking out for the safety of their uh, offspring stroke siblings. It's like... They really don't need quite that much protection. They don't need quite as much, you know, coddling or protection as you're giving them here. I think, you know, you're not giving them enough credit as thinking rational creatures. Uh, But again, it's it's the whole thing. Apple Bloom has insisted multiple times, I'm not a baby. I think, though, this episode, though, was really where she has finally been able to definitively prove that. Because she's had so many times. That was another thing I liked, actually. I mean, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here, but the whole fact that this episode was, you know, kind of the culmination of so many times where Apple Bloom has insisted again and again and again that she's not a baby and that she can fend for herself, this is where she finally actually proved it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that's true. Yeah, and you know, in the case of p- people th- being overprotective to the extreme, b- having real life examples, uh, I knew a family. They had a baby uh, when I was uh, living next to them, and I went to their houses, uh, their house one time, and they had all the knives. They were wrapped in plastic, Ooh. like all the knives. Every every uh, you open the drawer, every single knife, and it was wrapped in plastic with a cork on the top. Yeah, it's like, I, and I'm like. Wow, that is really going to the extreme. And uh, no joking, an entire drawer full of like like kitchen knives and and cutlery and all that wrapped in plastic paper and a cork on the tip. Well, if you guys see uh, the pony live stream, you do notice an ad where they talk about uh, this one diaper commercial, and in that ad they did this like a. Uh, First child, oh, you need to wash your hands before you can touch my baby. Second child, okay, whatever, you can touch it. I don't really care. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, that's the level of insanity that um, somebody can take care of someone. And in Applejack's case, this is her little sister. Like, this is Apple Bloom, the youngest of the family. And there's no more younger than that because if Kate Cannon states... Mother and father are no more. A word of God has stated that. Yeah. But uh, here's an interesting thought I just had actually related to all this. I wonder if when they were younger, if Big Mac had similar concerns over Applejack. And then, you know, when we saw that scene where Applejack, <laughs> you know, stops and looks all worried and then decides to turn back. I wonder if that look on Big Mac's face was a case of, oh boy, here we go. I yeah. think you're wasting your time. That would have been. That was his thought process at that point. That would have been brilliant. Like, oh my, have I been there before? (laughs) The reason he's not stopping her is because he's just like, I know trying to stop her would be utterly pointless. She's just going to have to go and learn. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, we talk about the issue of this series. So why not we talk about the things that we like and dislike? Yeah. Good idea. Um, Mm -hmm. I have to say. Uh, lots of things I liked in this episode. Probably the the thing that stands out above all else was that chimera. Oh, yeah. That was really well done. That was very well designed. I mean, when it showed up, you know, when we saw Apple Bloom going through the swamp and then, you know, we see, you know, this dark silhouette coming along, I was like, hold on. I was like, that doesn't look like anything we've seen before so far. I mean, uh, and I initially thought, wait, is that, you know, I thought, is that how he's auto making a, a reappearance here? It initially looked a bit like his shape. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But then, you know, as, a, as it took shape and got closer and then, you know, the light starts coming, I was like, wait a minute. And I was like, ah, that's a chimera. Yay! That was, I liked seeing that because it's like, you know, it's yet another cue that they've taken from mythology. Um I have a gripe to take with the Chimera, though. Oh, okay. I agree with Sketchy. The first time I saw the Chimera showing up, it, it was it was great. It was like such a build-up. Like, you see the shadow looming, getting closer towards Apple Bloom. Then you see a pair of eyes, then another pair of eyes, then a third pair of eyes, and they are all coming from three different heads. <laughs> and it's like, it, then it gets into the light, and it looks so scary and intimidating because, oh my God, we have never seen any like anything like this. 
And then it speaks. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> and it's not like it has a, a, a voice to stop to stop like you know nations like I am going to kill you or something like that. No, it speaks like like a whining. Like it 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 doesn't speak. It whines. I oh god and that the the the, the ble the the bleating of the or what do you call it blating or what what do goats do? What? Yeah, they beat. Yeah, it's like and and I'm like oh wow okay so we went from. Never-ending story, scary kind of creature to the three-headed knight from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> okay, which one is Graham Chapman? Which one is is Michael Palin? And which one is like what is the? Am I supposed to be laughing and pissing my pants with laughter or pissing my pants with fear? But, so yeah, I was rather confused. I was like, oh come on, let down, let down. I'm like, come on, guys. You had something great, you had something scary, and yeah. you don't screw it up. This creature doesn't need to talk. There are many uh, creatures in Equestria that don't need to speak. Yeah, but James, you're forgetting one thing. This is a show for kids, and kids are afraid of things, so we can't make it scary. Yeah, well, what about the cockatrice in Season 1? Or when Spike turned into a giant dragon? They didn't talk. They were scary. They were huge. Spike did talk when he was a huge dragon, but all he said was, Spike won! Well, but when he turned into Spike Silla, he didn't say a word. The audience were ready for that. But yeah, I mean, it, it, and if we talk about things that, uh, that might have gripes or not, that is my one and only gripe with the entire episode. The mm, absolute yeah. only one. Eh, well, for me, I, I don't have any gripes with this episode, honestly speaking. I mean, every scene uh, works well, and the whole Applejack being overprotective scene works. The whole Apple Bloom wanting to be independent works. The whole CMC scene works. And the Chimera, for me, it didn't bother me that much, like how it did for you. So, I mean, this whole episode for me was okay. What I thought was hilarious, though, and also actually a stroke of brilliance on the part of the writers as well, was that whole scene when Applejack had returned to Sweet Apple Acres. She discovers the Cutie Mark Crusaders there and, you know, is told of Apple Bloom's plan. And then she asks this series of seemingly absolutely ridiculous questions. She goes, you know, did she take the fireproof boots? Did she take the... Lion uh, Cherries. Yeah, and did she take some ricotta? It's like, what? Why the hell... <laughs> any of those items at all have you gone insane applejack but then we cut to the scene and she meets the chimera it's like and suddenly it starts to make sense and it really makes sense when applejack turns up and it's like oh she has the fireproof boots because it's a fire swamp which by the way have to mention here that was a brilliant cue that was a brilliant uh reference to the princess bride because that's <laughs> totally where the fire swamp came from yes uh, and yeah, it's like some of the fireproof boots make sense because it's the fire, you know, the fiery swamp. The lion taming chair makes sense because, you know, he uses that to jam the chimera's tiger jaws open. Um, the, uh, what was the other thing? Um, it was, uh, uh, yeah, no, no, it was the uh, snake charming flute. Oh, yeah, the snake charming flute. It's like suddenly that makes sense as well because, you know, she puts the, she puts the snake head to sleep. She jams the tiger's jaws open. And then gets it to impale, embed itself in a tree, and then finally she feeds the goat's head some ricotta cheese. It's like when you see it in context, suddenly it all makes sense. But it's like you know, just when that bit before, you know, just when she asked that series of questions, it's like Applejack, have you finally gone completely and utterly out of your mind? It's brilliantly done because of the fact that there was the nonsensical things she'd said earlier, such mm. as you know, saying. I forgot to say that if she wants to get a knife out of the drawer, she has to open the drawer first. So it's like, it just comes off as her, you know, more protective ridiculousness. It's like, like you've lost it. She hasn't. There is a trope in movies and TV shows called Chekhov's gun. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah. And yeah, the upgraded version of Chekhov's gun is Chekhov's armory, <laughs> where it basically is setting up a lot of things. And then giving them a sensible payoff at the end of the episode or, or the movie. This is something that James Cameron does in every single one of his movies. And this is something that this episode does in this, the exact same fashion that uh, Sketchy just said. Like, that was an absolute example of Chekhov's harmony. <laughs> and by the way, now that you mentioned the fireproof boots, 
Can we dedicate like an hour and a half to talk about how <laughs> Applejack looks in Fire <laughs> Fruit Loops, please? <laughs> I think rather than an hour and a half of that, I think all we'd need to do at this point in the episode is just flash up that one picture you drew and leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what, Norman, I'm going to ask you, put that uh, that picture for the rest of the episode <laughs> review on the video, like right now, and have them just, they're not going to pay attention to what we're going to say because they're going to look at the picture all the time. Okay, boss. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was going to say, I, I'm... I'm not so sure whether that be a case of... Well, I mean, it, it, that sort of counted both as a case of Chekhov's gun or Chekhov's armory, and also sort of, to some extent, as a brick joke. Mm. In terms of the way it was presented, how there was the whole thing earlier of Applejack having all these silly concerns, like, you know, about Applebloom's general level of intelligence. And then the whole fact of, the, of, of uh, her actually having a legitimate concern... That was sort of a brick joke, the way that worked. Because, mm-hmm. like, you know, if you take some, you know, it was something that was seemingly stupid that then turns up later and is actually relevant. Mm-hmm. It's like one of those Adventure Time series where a chain of event doesn't really make sense, but in the long run, it does make sense. Yeah. I will say it's a good combination of the both because it's a funny event, but it's also useful mm-hmm. because Applejack is using all those things as weapons. Uh, by yeah. the way, that chair, that automatic <laughs> folding chair, <laughs> that, that, she stole that from James Bond or something. That was awesome. Oh uh, no, <laughs> Doctor Who made it. <laughs> it's like, but yeah, I mean, this is one of the best parts of the entire episode. Is that it, 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 the whole thing is a build up to this one action scene, and it's it's actually it's surprisingly long. It's very well done. It's very well paced, and it's really well shot. Mm-hmm. In that Applejack is a complete badass. She is like doing dodges and and. Uh, uh, like com- completely avoiding the the Chimera's attacks like a pro, mm-hmm. she knows what she's doing. She's been complete boss, and I think that's what differentiates this uh, this kind of like I don't trust what I don't tr- I don't trust you with your security story that mm-hmm. other stories don't do. At this point, in any other TV show, uh, there would have been a moment where Applejack is proven to be wrong for her concerns mm-hmm. and. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like, is Applebloom the one who ends up saving her life? But no, in this one, Applejack actually has a lot of muscle to put on those, on those words and those con- concerns. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's brilliant. And by the way, guys, th- I think this episode finally proves how good of a character Applejack is. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. Applejack Definitely. has always been that good of a character. But the problem with the whole season uh, one, two, three was Applejack was too good. There was no conflict with her. So she was relegated to the background. Yeah, there were... Th- yeah, people lost lost interest in Applejack because the writers were not doing many things with her. They, they were just focusing on her simplicity and uh, how charming that, that, simpli- that simplicity is. But they were not taking advantage of it. And in season four, they are taking full advantage of it. Like, try to think a moment where Applejack... Uh, had like a, a bad scene, <laughs> or mm. was proving to be useless. None really. Yeah. That I can think of. Yeah, I mean, in in Power Ponies, she is the uh, Mistress Marvelous, and she's the first one to get used to her superpowers mm-hmm. in simple ways. What scene in simple ways doesn't doesn't Applejack shine? Yeah, she, she's great in every single one of them. In Mind you, that's oh, a sort of Applejack fan service. <laughs> <laughs> In uh, in Pinky Apple Pie, she was also really good. Oh God, the the, the faces that she has in that episode—they yeah. are unbelievable. Mm-hmm. So that, that was a complete goldmine of hilarious faces. Yeah. Let's be honest. I mean, it gave us the Pinkie Pie duck face. <laughs> uh, yeah, true. Yeah, and I, I'm not, uh, my favorite one is Applejack blushing while she's mm. standing at the door. Yeah, <laughs> she's blushing and smiling, going <laughs> uh, and I'm like, that's that's hilarious. But, but, I love it. I love it. But you know, gents, I'm noticing something on this review. We're just talking about the Chimera scene. You, we can't forget that in the beginning and in the middle, there's a lot of good scenes, like especially facial expressions. Like I'm just gonna jump straight forward to the CMC scene where the CMCs were planning on how to let. Apple Bloom escape and they decide to dress up as her and lay down in bed. And the first scene that I really loved was that Sweetie Belle was afraid, so afraid that she might get caught. That facial expression was so good. Yeah. Speaking of that scene, actually, just rewinding a bit from that scene, can we just take a moment to appreciate how hilarious it was that they had a, a song fake out? <laughs> yes! <laughs> 
<laughs> and it was oh, it was broken precisely by Scootaloo, who from the very beginning she didn't like songs. Oh god. We don't have time for a song, guys. Come on. <laughs> no time for a song. Come on. Right. To be honest, to be honest, when I first heard the song, oh okay, yeah, another song, this is so awesome. And then like, wait, why is Michelle Kreber singing out of key? Well, no, this is a bad song. Oh, and then the fake out. Oh, okay, now I understand. All right. Also, can we say that Applejack that didn't get her hat from her daddy, and she has a a, 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 a wardrobe in her house, chuck full yeah. of hats and bows? That I was just like, what? I was like, why do you guys have a closet stuffed this full of hats and bows? What because, is wrong with you? Because she's like Batman. She has replacements. Don't you see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> oh yeah. Well, I guess if you go and fight chimeras and fire breathing swamps, you kind of need to have spares mm. of everything. True. And <laughs> and one thing I have to say that this show has a lot of spaghettis. Yeah, it keeps falling on 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 <laughs> oh, on <laughs> on <laughs> oh god. And 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 the, and the way they discuss the way Apple Loom sleeps. Mm. How does she sleep? <laughs> like she does everything That's with sass. Yes. <laughs> Oh, well, I, I do love those kind of things. And, oh, man. Sassel. Yeah. Sassel Bloom. <laughs> With a lot of sass. That is, so, that is a really cool thing for them to say. Oh, boys. This show, this episode, the facial expression, the jokes, they hit so hard. They hit so hard with goodness. They leave yes. a good impact, they, mm-hmm. they, and they leave you. They leave you with a good taste in your mouth. Like after you're done watching the episode, you are like, "Yeah, I just watched a really good episode. I had I had a lot of fun watching it." And again, I may say it, I enjoyed it way more than I'm willing to admit. Yeah. Also, also, Caitlin ponies are now canon. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Oh, now, mama, don't be like that. <laughs> <laughs> Cajun pony can oh talking about Cajun ponies the one dancing on the table that reminds me of peanuts peanuts Snoopy for other people you mean from know. Snoopy yep. you mean from Charlie Brown yep huh didn't thought of that you yep. might be right yep the one uh, pony who's dancing on the table who looks like um uh, who looks like the big Lebowski pony. Also, someone made a parallel between two of the ponies uh, being the, at the swamp party and the Mythbusters. Yeah. Oh, it looks like oh. we got a Cajun pony. <laughs> Sorry. Is this when you start doing that? Can you resist going? If we're going to mention Cajun ponies, we have to have banjos. Come yeah. on, guys. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. But, uh, okay, uh, bottom line, really good episode. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Really, really good episode. Very good <coughs> debut from uh, from Scott Sonborn, who, up until now, this is the first pony episode that he has written. There were shortcomings here and there, certainly. I mean, I can see why people would have... Uh, I can see why people accused... I would have accused Applejack of being a tad out of character because, uh, okay, her actions here and there were uh, somewhat exaggerated, but I think that was merely exaggeration for the sake of comedy and for the sake of um, getting a point across. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, besides when her, exa- when her exaggerations actually get paid off with the chimera appearing at the end and her being a complete badass taking care of the situation, that kind of like puts a mute point on every concern that you may have. Mm-hmm. Oh, one of the small thing actually regarding the chimera that I, I have to bring up. I loved the, Dis- the Disney reference oh, with it. Oh, yes. It's this a reference. reference to car, right? You didn't spot it. The, it's, it, there was a, there's a reference to car from the Jungle Book when the snake head starts ah, to... Yes. Is an apple bloom. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Oh, my God. I forgot. You're right. We're almost just waiting for it to go, trusting me. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing, guys. Um, did anybody feel that there's a reference to Kung Fu Panda with the snake, with her voice? Not really. Not really. Every no. single snake in cartoons has spoken like that since the beginning of cartoons. Mm. Well, I guess just yeah. me then. Yeah. On the whole, I think it was still quite a good episode. As I say, I can see where people would criticize and where people would say it has some shortcomings because 
it was by no means perfect. I mean, as you said, uh, Glims, you had your complaints about how the Chimera sounded. You know, it looked like a really badass, and then it started talking. Yeah, right? yeah. That's um, that's my literal uh, only complaint with it. Yeah. Um, and I can see where people would criticize it for that kind of thing. But nevertheless, I thought, all in all, certainly for a debut episode, he could have done a lot worse. Yeah, um, of course. I hate to bring this up. I hate it. I hate to do this because I kind of like that episode, but this episode is definitely not the mysterious murder well. Oh, yeah, honestly. Yeah, yeah like, guys, this is not that This is not that level of... Uh, Out of characterness. Uh, poor, poor quality. Um, when, it com- when it comes to, debut, to, to debuts, in my opinion, uh, the best ones this series has ever had is... Uh, uh, Castlemania mm-hmm. with Josh Haber mm-hmm. and Sleepless in Ponyville with Cory Powell. So, <laughs> yeah, to be honest with you, that's that, that this episode doesn't reach those levels of great, but it does reach a level of really good. Well, it's true because as a first time writer for a show that is, well, let's put it like this a show for little girls, it's not that bad. No, like, oh, come on, the, the, the scene at the, in the fire swamp, that doesn't look like something you expect to see in a show that is like, okay, yeah, this is not for little girls. This is actually, it, this is for children. Mm-hmm. This is an all ages, all genders TV show that mm-hmm. everyone can enjoy. And that's the moment when you forget about it. You see, in the previous episode, I was talking about how you don't forget that this is a, a 22 minute long commercial. Mm-hmm. For, for Hasbro toys, but with this episode, you easily forget about that. Oh, yeah, that yeah. is true, that is true. I think another thing also here now that um, with this episode out and with certain other episodes out, I, I can feel that any other writer coming into the show will have a good chance at scoring a good episode because they write it as how they would normally write it. Like, if you're writing for Adventure Time, you would write uh, the same feel for Adventure Time on this show. If it gets um, approved by Hasbro, that will be awesome. If not, you have to work it out again. Well, that's because you have you have Megan McCarthy helping out doing the story editing. And uh, may I say, guys, she's doing a great job this mm-hmm. season. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's true, it's true. But anywho, I, I think we already talked our likes and dislikes. So, final thought, guys? Final thoughts. Um, all in all... Quite a good episode, quite enjoyable. I definitely will need to watch it a few more times to uh, formulate a more concrete opinion on it. But I mean, from the first impression I had from it, from watching it when it uh, when it was streamed, I really did quite enjoy it. I liked I liked how it unfolded. I liked the progression from scene to scene. I think probably the high point of the episode for me was the payoff at the end of it when right after Applejack has fended off the Chimera single-handedly or single-hoofedly, if you prefer, and she just assumes that um, because Apple Bloom is all the way up up here on her own and she assumes because she can't see the pie cart that Apple Bloom, you know, must have gone totally failed and she's, you know, she's just commiserating her saying, well, you know, it's good that you're alive. You know, it's like you, we, you lost the pie cart, but, you know, the, the important thing is that you're alive and you're okay. And then Apple Bloom just casually trots off and brings out the pie cart, and it's like, you know, here it is. And Applejack is genuinely shocked that her sister is so capable, and she's like, wait, so you brought this all the way up here, all by yourself, through all the difficult stuff on the way, through the fire swamp and this far. And, and like, the chimera. And, and, you know, and that chimera. And she's like, yeah. And she's like, well, she then has to genuinely accept at that point. And you can see, though, she's not uh, apprehensive about accepting it. She's actually genuinely relieved to be able to accept the fact that, yes, Apple Bloom can, in fact, look after herself and is independent enough and capable enough that she can do things on her own. And, she, and you know, and she just she just says it. She's like, well, you know, something that can do that doesn't need me constantly looking after her. You know, and then she acknowledges her mistakes and so forth. And, you know... It's it's a great way to conclude the episode with her, you know, just realizing her mistakes, owning up to it, and, uh, you know, acknowledging that Apple Bloom has indeed grown. And I think that was a great bit of character development for the both of them, both in seeing that, uh, and okay, granted, we've seen Apple Jack own up to her mistakes before. I mean, heck, she did it all the way back in Apple Buck season when she finally admitted that she needed help. But it was still good to see her then be able to be mature enough 
to acknowledge that Apple Bloom as well is, you know, a growing and maturing mind in her own right and is actually capable of perhaps more than she'd given her credit for. Seeing that, I think, was was quite uh, was was quite a key moment in the episode and uh, quite a big thing for the both of them. And it was a major moment for Apple Bloom as well, I think, finally getting that acknowledgement from Apple Bloom, from Applejack that she's been looking for for like the past four seasons. Let's be honest, because mm. as I say, it was you know even all the way back in season one in Bridal Gossip, she said, "I'm not a baby." <laughs> and it's like finally she's got an Applejack to acknowledge that yes, she's not a baby. She can do things on her own. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and that's that's kind of interesting because at the end of that one episode, that thing wasn't resolved. Like Applejack yeah. still thought that she had to take care of her sister. I mean, uh, yeah, you're right. At the end of Bridal Gossip, you know, Applejack had still, you know, the whole reason they'd gone in there was because she was she thought, oh, you know, this zebra must be making soup out of my out of my sister. Uh, we better go and rescue her because there's no way she'll be able to survive on the Everfree Forest on her own. Um, but as it turned out, Apple Bloom was absolutely fine and her her concerns were ungrounded and okay granted this time around her concerns were a bit more had a bit more legitimate grounding to them because when she did catch up to apple bloom apple bloom was genuinely in trouble but uh nevertheless had still managed to get the pie cart this way with it without any assistance so yeah all in all that was the main thing i took away from it was that whole thing of um apple Jack finally acknowledging apple bloom as you know more mature than she had given her credit for. Um, yeah, all in all, good episode. Um, well written, well resolved in the end. No real complaints. Okay, that's good. James? Well, I, I don't know if I can like compliment what Sketchy said in a, in a better fashion. Like I completely agree with everything he said. Yeah, it's uh, very well written, very well acted, really entertaining. Uh, towards the end, very really an action-packed episode um, about a sister learning to know when to like stop watching over her little sister because let's face it we all we, we older brothers we have had this all the time like forever i had it with my sister i'm pretty sure everybody else had it with their different siblings that you want to watch over them all the time and it's really hard to move on and, and face the fact that you don't need to take care of them anymore mm. so yeah I, I really like the episode very relatable my only gripe with it is to be honest very petty childish complaining when it comes to like oh I don't like the Chimera's boys but everything else was great except for the Chimera's boys <laughs> <laughs> and as for me I do enjoy everything about this episode from the morals uh, trying to tell from Apple Jack's kind of uh, overbearing nature and overall this is a good episode and a good debut for Scott Sunborn and well I, I can't say anything much like all the gripes that you have uh, don't really relate to me uh, for me this is a really good debut really good episode and really good apple bloom slash uh applejack episode and i do agree with how it resolved the um it resolved the fact that apple jack trusts apple bloom now and sees her as a grown-up now so yeah wow overall oh absolutely absolutely positive uh feel this is wonderful uh I think this is why we don't get more viewers is because we are so positive that people don't like, people don't like positivity on the internet. They oh, like yeah. the negative stuff. Oh yeah, okay. If you're negative, uh, James, you don't like the chimera talking, right? This reminds me of General Grievous in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> he was oh, awesome God. when he was not talking, but when he talked, he was not awesome. Yeah. I don't think he was awesome as, at all. I think he was a pretty lame villain. Well, he was he was far more terrifying in uh, in the Clone Wars animated mm, stuff. Where he was not talking. <laughs> well, no, even when he talked in that, he sounded more terrifying because at that point he hadn't had his lungs crushed by <laughs> Mace, so he didn't have his uh, his trademark smoker's cough. <laughs> uh, fun fact about that one: that was George Lucas coughing. Today in in Star Wars: The Clone Wars podcast, <laughs> we're going to review this episode. No, uh, <laughs> okay, guys, come on. Yeah, okay, no, still. no, that's it. 
that's it for today's uh, reviews. There's so many reviews, guys. Mm. And next week's episode, that's it. That means the episode that we're going to watch in a couple of days. <laughs> yes. Because we do these reviews even later than usual. Mm. Uh, it's Stop. the mystery of the media and how we work. <laughs> I keep dating this. Why do I do this? <laughs> So, next week's episode is uh, Mod Pie, written by another new comment, Noel Benvenuti. It's episode 18 of season 4. So, that's going to be released on the 15th of March, one day after my birthday. <laughs> Did I tell you guys it was my birthday on the 14th? Because it's my birthday. No, you didn't. No. Happy <laughs> it is my birthday. Happy birthday, James. <laughs> <laughs> it's the 14th for me now, so happy birthday. <laughs> I'm getting kind of annoying with that. I'm sorry, but hey, I want to. I want to celebrate. That's cool. It's cool. It's your birthday. <laughs> it is my birthday. Anyway, okay. Well, this is for this week's episode review. Mm-hmm. I've been James Cork. I have been Norman Sanzo. Uh, I'm still Sketchy Sounds. Last time I checked. <laughs> you have to check your ID card again. Make sure it says Sketchy Sounds on it. If it doesn't, then you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> And this has been the episode review for